Hi, I'm Dr. Patrick Jones from the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. And uh, I wanted to just chat for a minute today about research, scientific research and herbal medicine. Um, and just to give you a little background, my, my road to becoming an herbalist has been pretty unusual as herbalists go. Um, I actually am a licensed veterinarian. I was a practicing veterinarian for about 30 years. Um, before that, my intention with my education was to do research. Uh, I was going to do a PhD um, and made some different decisions, had pretty strong feelings that I needed to do something different that I was barking up the wrong tree. And so I went into veterinary medicine, um, got my doctorate in veterinary medicine and thought, well, I'll do research on this, right? Uh, practical, real world, hands-on important research, you know, not just esoteric, you know, super reductionist science stuff. We'll solve real problems. Um, and so I thought, well, that's good. That fits better. And I, uh, got, all lined out to do a PhD. Um, and I started, I mean, I was working in a research laboratory uh, during the last year of veterinary school. Uh, I wrote some papers uh, that were published in, in respected research journals. Um, and then the gentleman that was going to do my PhD, you know, the main guy that I was going to work with, died uh, abruptly and unexpectedly. Um, very sad, very great guy. Um, and so again, I was sort of, uh, wondering what I should do next and, um, got the feeling that I should go into practice, uh, for a while. And so I did that and I never went back, but my point is that I understand research. Um, I've been in that field. I've, I've written, you know, peer reviewed papers and had them published. Uh, I know how it works. Okay. And I can read a research paper and. You know, I've had enough education in that field that I know what they're talking about. All right. Uh, and so I do a lot of looking at herbal research. Um, and it's great. I mean, it's, you know, a very powerful tool for folks that are herbalists um, that can understand it to use to, to understand things better to maybe raise more questions, to see applications for things um, based on what we're learning about these remarkable plants. And, uh, you know, there's mountains of research showing efficacy of botanical phytochemicals for all kinds of, you know, illnesses. Um, if you ever want to know how much research there is, and if anybody really says that herbs work, go to Google Scholar and type in any plant you want, use the Latin name, but any plant you want, and you'll have pages and pages and pages of research studies on, you know, the, the actions and the phytochemistry and the benefits of those plants. I mean, it's not like we're making this stuff up, right? And research in recent years has gotten really excited about these plants and they're doing some really great studies. Um, but let's understand a couple of things about research. First of all, the hallmarks of really good research are, first of all, the studies are very precise and they're very repeatable, all right? When a researcher asks a question, he wants to know that the answer he's getting is the answer to that question, right? And so they create a study with very, you know, defined restrictive parameters uh, that can be repeated again. So that they can say, you know, it, it happened this time, let's do it again and see if it happens again. And they'll know that nothing changed, right? So we're going to use the same subject, the same compounds delivered in the same way at the same times of day. You know, I mean, it's very precise, very exact, right? And that's good. They also strive, if they're good researchers, they strive to eliminate as many variables as they can. Um, and so that they know that the question they're answering is the question they're asking, right? And so they tend to be very reductionist in their approach. You know, uh, for example, if you suspected as a researcher, if you had a hypothesis, which is an unproven idea, 
Okay. I have a hypothesis that smoking causes cancer, for example. All right. Um, they're going to want to know what it is about smoking that causes cancer. Okay. They're going to want to know. They're going to. The first study could be well, we gave a thousand people a pack a day and had them smoke a pack a day for 20 years, and, you know, a lot of them got cancer. So that sort of supports the hypothesis that smoking causes cancer. And then they're going to dissect that, and they're going to say, well, what is it about tobacco that causes cancer? Is it the nicotine? Is it the tar? Is it the paper the cigarette wrapped in? Is it some other chemical, you know, in the tobacco? And they're going to really, really get very detailed about what is it that's the problem, all right? Um, and that's great, but it answers a very specific question, okay? Uh, and that's great, too, you know, as long as we understand the specificity of the question, okay? So let me give, the problem is that we get into what I call the error of inference, okay? So inference or inferring something is drawing a conclusion from a data set and applying that conclusion to other things, all right? And that's a good tool. That's a very important tool for a researcher. That's a very important tool for an inventor or a mathematician or anybody else. You know, that it's the what if. You know, if this is true, well, does that mean that's true, right? And as long as it's a question, creating other questions and creating other research, that's fantastic. When it's a conclusion, that's an error sometimes, all right? So, for example, let's, let me give you a sort of a rudimentary example. Uh, if I said, um, you know, I'm, I'm, we're remodeling our house right now, of course. My wife loves to remodel my houses. And so we're remodeling our house. And, you know, if I'm hammering a nail into a wall and I whack my thumb with the hammer, right? And it really hurts that I can say, hmm, I think hitting my thumb with the hammer caused pain in my thumb, right? And I could create a study that showed that if I whack my thumb with a hammer, it consistently causes pain. I haven't done this research formally, but I have done a little bit of this research uh, just sort of, you know, uh, to collect anecdotal evidence. And I have found that whacking my thumb with the hammer almost always causes pain in my thumb. Okay, that's all. <laughs> my, hop, my hypothesis uh, is proven or supported, not proven, by anecdotal evidence, right? Um, it's not proven by research, but I suppose it is pretty likely. I'm inferring that it's pretty likely that that research would pan out and I would show that that hurts, right? That the hammer causes pain. Now, uh, if I write a research paper that says, you know, thumb whacking with a two-pound steel hammer at a velocity of X results in nerve pain, right? Then I could make some inferences and assumptions from that, that if I hit my thumb with a bigger hammer, that would also hurt. Or if I hit my finger with a hammer instead of my thumb, that would also hurt. Those are logical inferences, right? But what I shouldn't do is say hammers are dangerous, right? There's a research study that shows hammers are dangerous. Well, yeah, there's a research study that shows if you whack your thumb with a hammer, that's dangerous and it could cause damage to your thumb. But, it, but I can't infer from that, therefore, I shouldn't use hammers because research shows they're dangerous, all right? And sometimes we make the mistake, and we all do it. I mean, herbalists do it too. You know, oh, I read that was bad, right? I read it on the internet that that was bad uh, because there was some study that this guy quoted, right? And we, we make inferences sometimes that are erroneous. Um, and. Uh, I'll give you an example, okay? I had a client. I gave him, you know, a few herbs that I'd used and had occasionally had some success with, not always. Um, and one of those herbs was ginkgo biloba, right? Ginkgo. And uh, he was a very uh, analytical fellow, very intelligent fellow. And so he got on Google Scholar and he started looking at studies and on these plants. 
And he found a study on ginkgo that showed that ginkgo caused liver cancer and thyroid cancer, right? And he called me back and said, well, that ginkgo stuff, it doesn't look very safe. It looks like it causes liver cancer and thyroid cancer. And I said, hmm, I've never heard or thought anything bad about ginkgo, really. Uh, and so I looked at the study, right? And uh, the study showed, in fact, that the extract of ginkgo biloba fed to mice at fairly high doses daily for two years caused cancer, All right? That's the question. The question wasn't, is ginkgo safe at normal medicinal doses for humans? The question was, what happens if I give 2,000 milligrams per kilogram of ginkgo extract, not the plant, a concentrated extract of the plant, to mice every day for two years? And the answer is that they got cancer, right? And so there was no fault whatsoever with that study. I read the study. It was very well designed. It was very precise. It was very repeatable. It was all the variables were taken out that they could take out. It was a very nicely designed, good scientific study that showed that at those levels over that time period in that species, ginkgo extract, the concentrated extract, not the plant, had this effect, all right? And so I would say, what, what can I know for a fact from that research? Well, I can know for a fact that if I take that dose of the extract, the concentrated extract of that plant every day for two years, and I'm a mouse, then I will have probably the same result, right? I'll probably get liver cancer too, right? <clears throat> Interestingly, as I read deeper into the study, the male mice had much higher cancer rates and the female mice had lower cancer rates than the control group. Okay. Which is also interesting. Okay. That brings up all kinds of other questions. <laughs> What's the difference between a mouse liver if you're a boy mouse and a mouse liver if you're a girl mouse? And there's other questions. What's the difference between a mouse liver if you're a mouse and a human liver if you're a human? Right. And so, there's all kinds of unanswered questions, and the researchers didn't pretend to answer any of those other questions. They just answered the question they were asking, which was a good question, you know. Um, and so, but the inference is, from somebody reading the title of the study, that ginkgo is, causes liver cancer, right? And they broaden the result. They, they make inferences about the result, which aren't proven, and frankly, from, from what I understand about the plant and what I understand about how the plant is typically used, typically dosed, uh, and the lengths of time for which it's typically used and the amount that's typically used, um, I don't think ginkgo is risky for cancer at all, you know, realistically. Uh, and until someone does a study that shows that taking a teaspoon of ginkgo powder, the plant, not the extract, taking a teaspoon of that a couple of times a day, you know, for a couple of weeks causes liver cancer. I'm not going to worry about it, right? Because the likelihood, now I'm making an inference, right? The likelihood uh, that I would have the same result that they had in that study by doing a completely different thing is very low, okay? Um, and so, as you're looking at research, look very carefully and ask yourself, what is the question they're asking and what is the question they're answering, right? Because that might be very, very different than the question you're asking, right? Which is to want to know if this is safe or not safe. We just have to be careful. Um, you have to be careful to know that the research was good in the first place, which that research was good. But then you have to make sure that you don't commit the error of inference, okay? And infer things from that study that don't really have any bearing at all 
on the question that you're trying to answer. And unfortunately, there's a tendency uh, among medical professionals to say, well, nope, I saw a study that that was carcinogenic. Well, did you look really closely at the study? Because if you didn't, you're kind of making a mistake. All right. And so my advice is just to, as you're looking at research, really look at it. Really look at what's the question, what's the answer. And absolutely, you should err on the side of safety. You know, if something causes miscarriages and is not safe during pregnancy in mice, don't take it. All right. But if something causes cancer, if the subject consumes the equivalent of a human consuming pounds of it every day for years, you can probably take that one with a grain of salt. Okay. So I'm Dr. Patrick Jones from the Homegrown Herbalist School. We're going to be talking more about this in the school. I'm going to be doing some lessons on how to assess a study, how to use a study, how to figure out if the study is even any good, right? Um, just so that people can use that as a tool because research is a phenomenal tool. Um, and researchers are amazing people. I mean, we have, uh, you know, on faculty at Homegrown Herbalist School, we've got Dr. Brandon Rose, who's got a PhD in physiology, right? And he loves studying herbs and he studies herbs and has published a lot of good stuff on herbs. Um, but, you know, he likes getting into the nuts and bolts of how this works. And he and I like thinking about that and talking about that and figuring out, well, geez, if this is true, you know, if this herb is impacting cytochrome P450, why am I not using it for that too, right? And we start thinking about things and, and we're doing a little inference too uh, and a little hypothesizing, but that's how science works and that's good. Um, as long as we're using good research and good data to create good questions so that we can find good answers. So I'm Dr. Patrick Jones uh, from the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. Um, and I hope that, that people will do more research on herbal medicines. And I hope that people that are using herbs will look at the research but I hope that they will um, really, really be careful to understand what's, what the very, very specific question is and what the very, very specific answer is that that research study found. I'm Dr. Patrick Jones. Thanks for listening.